movement disorders. Yep, uh, I'm with Disorders. Um, he's currently the director of the Children's Vision Center and chief of ophthalmology at the Akron Children's Hospital Medical Center in Akron, Ohio. Dr. Hurdle received his bachelor's degree from the, the Ohio State University and his medical degree from Northeast Ohio University's College of Medicine. Following medical, medical school, Dr. Hurdle completed fellowships and residencies in ocular motility, emergency medicine, ophthalmology, and pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at a variety of medical centers around the country. Dr. Hurdle came to Akron in 2010 to grow the pediatric ophthalmology service after six years of chief of pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and professor of ophthalmology and bioengineering at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He has been a principal investigator on a number of NIH funded research projects, including ongoing studies of the treatment of strabismus, nystagmus, and amblyopia. As an avid researcher and publisher, Dr. Hurdle has over 200 refereed publications and almost as many abstracts, editorials, reviews, and invited lectures. He currently serves as the review, uh, reviewer on multiple journals and has been a recipient of over a million dollars in research funding. Dr. Hurdle has been very generous with the support of ANN over the years. I think he's spoken at nearly all of our conferences in the past, so we're thrilled to welcome him again here today. Just some logistics here. I think what we'll do is we'll have um, Dr. Hurdle will give his presentation, and if you have questions along the way, please uh, use the um, the Q and A. There should be a uh, either the chat or no, there should be a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen where you can pop up the Q and A window. Uh, so please put your questions in that, and Dr. Hurdle will take questions from that when he's done. And as you might have just seen, the uh, this session is being recorded, so all the uh, warnings that we've had earlier today about whether you want to be recorded or not. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Hurdle, and thank you much. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Joe and Evelyn, and thanks ANN again and the board. And it's really an honor and a, pr a privilege for me to be able to speak and share with all of you my professional long. Uh, interest in nystagmus and eye movement disorders. What I'm going to do over the next 35 to 40 minutes is try and consolidate with you in a meaningful way, actually a way that I describe to my colleagues what I understand about this disease, how we've come to understand it, and what we can do about it. And the point of discussing this in more scientific terminology than lay terminology is I think it allows me to communicate with you in a way that you'll understand this disease or try and research this for you or your family members in a different way. So I apologize in advance for some of the scientific terminology, uh, getting into the weeds with some data, but I really want to share with you what it is that we do when we study a, a clinical condition such as nystagmus. So I'm going to revert to my shared screen. I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint presentation. I've had to do this, I think, once completely without a PowerPoint presentation. That was uh, a little difficult. <laughs> but so you should be able to see my presentation here. I'm hoping that if you can see that, I think you should be able to see that. Yep, you look good. Okay, great. This is Children's Hospital. The um, you see the, the main hospital on your right, and then the K Jewelers Pavilion, which is where the surgery center is, and we're taking this from the new outpatient Considine, Considine building area. There's a lot of people over the last 30 years who've helped me with the work and the data that I'm going to present to you today. And these are most of the people who've helped me, including a, a whole bunch of animals, which uh, you'll see pictures of throughout the talk. And these are two of my favorite, Scout and Ginger. I have Ginger with me. I'll show you her a little bit later. And Scout is with a patient of mine in Montana. All of the information that Lou and I have worked on together and Lou Deloso prior to is available in a textbook. The publishers of this textbook that Lou and I spent a few years writing is really for our colleagues, both on the clinical and the scientific sides, but it's available free now online because the publisher is out of business. There's no copyright or patent left on the text and the text is available free as an entire PDF download with all the videos at a Lou's OmLab website that you see down on the left here. I, I want to talk first about naming and what it means to name things and words and names are extremely important. 
and what we call the types of nystagmus or eye oscillations that we see and who calls them that and where they're called that and why they're called that, I think are very important. I think naming allows us to begin a level of communication of understanding not only among scientists, but also between patients and families in us as well. These, this is an old textbook classification of nystagmus and nystagmus is an involuntary oscillation of the eyes, but not all involuntary oscillations of the eyes are nystagmus. There are actually oscillations of the eyes where there's no slow movement. Nystagmus is defined by the slow phase. It's the slow movement that actually is the pathology. Now it may not look slow clinically, it looks slow on eye movement recordings, but nystagmus typically has a slow phase in one direction and a fast phase in the other. Saccadic oscillations and intrusions or fast eye movement abnormalities, some of which you see listed here within old terminology, are a result of a different problem neurophysiologically. All types of nystagmus, uh, the dozens of types of nystagmus that are, are, are uh, present in human beings and in animals, seem to be a disease of the eye, but they're actually a disease of the brain. This is a neuromotor disease. It's not an eye disease. It's a neuroophthalmic or a neuromotor disease. And I'll, I'll, I'm gonna stress that as I go through the talk here. It's actually most of these in childhood that we'll be talking about are neurodevelopmental diseases. A very famous neuroophthalmologist named um, David Kogan, who uh, was one of the greatest ophthalmologists of the 20th century, in 1968, described and helped clinicians with understanding these forms of nystagmus in babies and infants and young children by characterizing and classifying those infants into two groups, a group of infants whose eyes wiggled and they could see they had good vision, and a group of infants whose eyes wiggled and couldn't see they had poor vision. So he called the former uh, motor nystagmus and the latter sensory nystagmus based on the fact that one could see and one couldn't. In the early 70s, now this is only about six or seven years after Dave Kogan came up with that classification, Lou DeLoso and Bob Daroff at, in Florida at the University of Miami at the Boston Palmer Eye Institute did eye movement recordings on all these kids and they showed at that time, this is in the early 70s, that the oscillation, the actual eye movement wiggling back and forth was the same in the kids that could see and the kids that couldn't. The nystagmus was one type of nystagmus and it didn't matter whether the child could see or not. Dave Kogan wrote a letter to Bob Daroff, which you see here up on the left saying, you know, Bob, you're right. I should never have called it motor and sensory. Those terms are outdated and outmoded. And then the textbooks around the world now and my colleagues who discuss nystagmus still call it congenital sensory and motor nystagmus, even though the guy that named it said we shouldn't do that anymore. And this, these are heated arguments between me and my colleagues about this kind of nomenclature. As a result of this dissonance in the way we name things and communicate things, when I was at NIH, we were supported uh, by the institution to develop an, a national, which is now expanded to become an international classification system for eye movement abnormalities and strabismus. And this was initiated by a group of diverse professionals from multiple fields of specialization, including neurology, ophthalmology, optometry, psychology, behavioral pediatrics, psychophysics, so that everyone who dealt with children who had this type of these types of problems had input into how these were classified and described. As a result of this, this classification, which I call the CMAS classification, has now been used by most of us in clinical science over the last 15 years. And these are the CMAS nystagmus types. These are the, the 11 broad diagnoses of nystagmus in human beings and, and mostly in animals as well. The three types that are common, most commonly present in infancy and early childhood are the three that you see on the right, 9, 10, and 11. I'll be discussing these in, in a little bit more detail. This child that you see down here, you know, when I talk at the nystagmus meetings, <laughs> you got a lot of you guys have come and see me. And so a lot of these you'll recognize either as yourself, your children, or maybe even your spouse now at this point. I'm getting so old that some of these, some of my patients have gotten married and had their own children. So uh, those three types you'll be, I'll be discussing, and that's infantile nystagmus syndrome, spasmus nutans, and fusion maldevelopment. 
I want to step back a little bit and discuss about examination techniques from a very broad perspective. When, when your child or you are examined by an eye care professional for nystagmus, there are a few characteristics. The first is that asking you or about or, or your um, family about the development of the oscillation. This is not congenital. And the way that we found this out, and most of you who've had children with nystagmus have contributed to this understanding. And if you haven't, you'll, you'll recognize this yourself. When you were given this beautiful baby right at birth and they wiped the mucus away from the baby's eyes, the first thing that mom looks at is the eyes. Usually it's the first thing. And the eyes are not wiggling at birth. The baby comes out, the eyes are not wiggling. The next thing that usually happens is they're the first feeding. And during the first feeding, mom is locking eyes with the eyes of the baby again. And many times they're asleep, but many times they're open. Usually there's no nystagmus then. The parents don't report any nystagmus. The next big event is leaving the hospital, which used to be five days later, now is five minutes later. But during that event, more people are around, the in-laws, the brothers and sisters, and there's no notice and the, the, uh, the uh, routine eye exam, the normal eye care, the normal eye exam in the unit has been done and there's no notice of nystagmus. And now we're almost out a week. The next big event is the first well baby check with the pediatrician and they don't notice any nystagmus. This is not congenital. The point is this is a developmental or early onset acquired disorder developmental disturbance of the oculomotor system, which occurs uniquely between one and four months of age, uniquely. If you give the same problem that could cause the nystagmus in the brain or eyes to a child at six months of age, they won't get nystagmus. I'll come back to that. This is a picture of me with uh, 40, I was with 70 families and 45 children here uh, with oculocutaneous albinism type one in China on one of my visits and what a really nice group of families. During the examination technique, it's important for anyone evaluating the child that they observe the child over time. The thing that makes children and adults with nystagmus different, the visual system the most different is their visual systems are dynamic. They do not have a static visual system. Those of us that don't have nystagmus, the world looks the same all the time. No matter how I look at it, it doesn't change. It may change if I'm fatigued or ill, the lights go up or down, but generally that's environmental. It's not me. Patients with nystagmus have a range of vision and visual function. They have their best vision and they have their worst vision. And that can be modified by many environmental and also factors within themselves, physiological factors such as emotion, fatigue, illness, sedation, medications. These patients will often take advantage of the fact that the nystagmus can get better during these times or eye positions and use their head, calm themselves, use medications to make their eyes slow down to get better. It's really important for my colleagues to look at the retina and optic nerve, especially with the newer equipment that we have, and also to spend a lot of time checking these children with both eyes open because covering one eye of children with infantile and childhood forms of nystagmus changes the nystagmus and affects vision. The reason, the, the main reason why we understand a lot of this, those of us that study it, like anything else, it's not because we're particularly smart, it's because we see a lot of patients with nystagmus and we do special testing, extra testing. And the most fundamental of these is to analyze the oscillation electrophysiologically with special testing equipment. So if cardiology did not use EKGs, if neurology did not use EEGs, th then their ability to understand the heart and the brain would really be hampered. Special testing is really an important part of modern medicine. It hasn't been implemented across the board in the study of nystagmus because the time it takes to acquire the knowledge and skill to perform and read the recordings is a little bit too demanding for the modern clinician. But the reason that we do it is because we get these squiggly lines and these squiggly lines mean a lot to those of us that look at this. So these squiggly lines, all the ones that you see exclusive of those surrounded by the red box are characteristic of infantile nystagmus. If I see a child who comes in and is otherwise healthy and normal and has one of these waveforms, they do not need an MRI. They do not need to see neurology. 
they have a, a, a condition that we know that there's no other brain pathology. These two waveforms can be part of INS, but they can also be part of acquired nystagmus, those conditions that are associated with significant brain or neurological diseases. So a simple recording, and this, the, the snapshots here are less than a second of data. The other techniques that we use to evaluate the system of the visual system are those that tell us about how the world is getting into the brain from the eyes. The visual system has two main parts, the input system or the afferent system and the output system or the efferent system. They have their own anatomy, physiology. They have their own genetics, their own developmental responses. To test the input system, I need other special testing, such as electroretinography, which tests the rods and cones, uh, contrast sensitivity testing, which tests how well the, the patient is able to pick up contrast, motion sensitivity. Uh, we can also take an optical biopsy using a special technique called OCT, which is, sorry, this technique here. But my colleagues don't have all this equipment or use all this equipment or know how to interpret the equipment. And I, don't, I, I didn't want to wait for them to catch up with all the testing, all the use of eye movement recordings to be able to help their patients. So there's a couple of things that I've done both diagnostically and therapeutically by developing algorithms that can bypass the use of this special testing equipment. And this is one of them. If this algorithm is followed clinically, then, and then neurological evaluation, including imaging or, neuro, or CAT scans or MRI, do not need to be done. And this is pretty easy to follow with any child. <clears throat> Most of the time, this will allow efficient and expert clinical care. I'm going to talk about the three diseases. The most common is infantile nystagmus syndrome. It used to be called congenital or congenital motor and sensory nystagmus. And as I mentioned before, they're really outdated and, and really confusing terms. These, this is the CMAS box. This is what it looks like. All of the diagnoses in CMAS have this box. And this box is there because this classification criteria, this classification system was designed to live, to grow, and to change. So the, so the criteria that are on the bottom may shoot to the top or a new one could become that. In infantile nystagmus, a diagnostic criteria is the waveform. The slow phase of the eye movement recording only occurs with INS. So if I only had only two things, the history, and I don't even need the history, I can have an adult who said they had nystagmus they think since childhood, and I do this recording, I can tell which type they had. There, there are some peculiarities about infantile nystagmus. And if you watch this young girl's eyes, uh, we'll be doing what's called a cover test to look for the strabismus too. But if you watch the intensity of her nystagmus, and it's pretty easy to see that it spontaneously starts getting more intense. She's not doing anything different, but changing her fixation from target to target. And as she changes her fixation, the eye moves out, which means she has a little bit of esotropia crossing underneath it. But you'll see here that nystagmus is getting worse all by itself. The cover didn't make it worse. It changed in intensity spontaneously. This is called infantile periodic alternating nystagmus. This is what the eye movements look like in a pure PAM patient. They'll spend 60 seconds jerking really hard to the right. They'll slow down almost stop and then spend 60 seconds jerking to the left, then slow down, almost stop and spend 60 seconds jerking to the right. And look how long it takes to figure this out. So if you don't look at the patient, if we don't look at our child or the patient for a period of time, then we may only see them during this period or this period or this period or this period. And they'll look totally different. For instance, if I ask my child to look at a TV screen and they have intense jerk right nystagmus, they'll have a right face turn. If I ask them to look at the TV screen here, they'll have no head posture. If I ask them to look at the TV screen here, they'll have an intense left face turn. And they'll have what everybody calls three null. They don't have three null positions. They have a changing null position dynamically because they have infantile periodicity. Most of the time, this doesn't occur periodically. It occurs aperiodically. I know I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but this is why it's complex. And this is why it's important to be evaluated 
by those of us that understand the dynamicity of this condition, because this changing back and forth can occur 10 seconds in one direction and a minute in the other, or then again, 30 seconds in one and five minutes in the other. So it doesn't have to be regular, it can be irregular. Why is, does this condition exist? I don't know what the exact physiology is, but I can tell you what's happening in the brain. If we take those two systems, the input system and the output system as two separate anatomic, physiologically distinct systems with their own genetics and their own development within this brain down here, what happens during development is that these systems talk to each other. And the metaphor that I use with families and patients all the time is imagine I have the train of the ability to see or the afferent system and the train, it's actually a train of the efferent system on the tracks ready to travel together at birth or slightly before birth. And imagine all the passengers on that one train and all the passengers on the other train are holding hands with each other. So the trains have to communicate with each other and move together so well that no, the hands can't be broken apart. If that, if that interruption is broken between one and four months of age, if the two, one of the two systems is ahead of each other or behind each other, the other, then they'll get nystagmus. And I'll give you an example. We have a child who is born with bilateral, complete congenital cataracts. No vision is going to get to the eye. In the womb, there's no problem. You don't need vision in the womb. There's no light. The brain is developing. The two systems are talking to each other very well. So they're at conception and in the womb, the, the hands are holding from each train. There's no break. At birth, the visual system gets turned on and the brain expects images. It expects light, it expects, it expects motion, and it expects color. And it's not getting it. So between birth and the first three months of life, it's broken by the cataracts. As a result, the afferent system is broken and slowed down. When this is slowed down, you get the nystagmus. We know this because if we take that same baby with bilateral congenital cataracts, take the cataracts out, restore their optical clarity, the nystagmus actually goes away and they never get it. So it's a time sensitive disturbance in development. That's very critical, it has a critical period. The other type that's the most, the second most type of nystagmus that gets confused with uh, infantile nystagmus is fusion maldevelopment. It used to be called latent nystagmus. And it's a continuous oscillation, but it has a peculiar change that doesn't occur spontaneously, but occurs with cover. When you cover one eye, the nystagmus changes direction. And I'll show you what that looks like. Here's a young woman again, who looks like her eyes are not oscillating at all. She looks like they're, she has no nystagmus. And clinically, it is silent clinically. Um, with recordings, we'll see it. But when you cover one eye, as soon as we cover one eye, then she starts getting an obvious nystagmus with a fast phase or jerk towards the ear of the same side. So she has left beating with right eye cover and then right beating with left eye cover or right eye viewing. And this is called a latent component. But does she have infantile nystagmus with the latent component or does she have fusion maldevelopment? Well, the way that we know that is we do recordings. And patients with fusion maldevelopment have slow phases that are linear or decreasing velocity. And what I mean by slow phases that increase or decrease, increasing is getting on the freeway and decreasing is getting off the freeway. The slow phase follows an, a trajectory. If it gets on the freeway, that's infantile nystagmus. If it's getting off the freeway, that's fusion maldevelopment nystagmus. And so these are getting off the freeway slow phases. Here's why it's confusing. Here's a young man who's had retinopathy of prematurity, a large angle esotropia, poor vision. And we cover his eye and he has jerk left nystagmus or with the right eye covered. And then we cover the left eye and he has jerk right nystagmus. So he must also have fusion maldevelopment nystagmus, right? He's got, that's what it looks like. Uh-uh. On recordings, he has infantile nystagmus. He has getting on the freeway waveforms, but he has a latent component. 40% of patients with infantile nystagmus will have a latent component. The only way to tell the difference between two completely different types of nystagmus, which requires slightly different treatments, is with eye movement recordings. The last type is a very rare type, and even I've seen patients now for over three decades, and I only have a, a dozen patients with this. It's extremely rare. 
is called spasmus nutans. And it's a triad of a head oscillation and bobbing, a head posture, and a high frequency asymmetric ocular oscillation. And it's, 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 um, it has a very characteristic appearance. And I'll show you these two videos down here. Oh, sorry. Sometimes it takes a while for these to load. And these can, these can be associated with tumors in the central nervous system, which is why these patients are get, are have x-rays. But you can see the head bobbing is very, is not typical of the head oscillation associated with infantile nystagmus, which is a horizontal no oscillation. This is a, a three-dimensional elliptical oscillation. And if you look at this little girl here, you watch her eyes, you can see it's more in the left eye than the uh, right eye, the oscillation. And it's a very high frequency, pen, a high frequency oscillation that's asymmetric between the two eyes. And has a characteristic, again, eye movement recording where one eye is going in one direction and the other eye is going in the other direction. And it's the only type of nystagmus that does that, again, is easily diagnosed with eye movement. So the, the visual system though is affected in patients with, in, with nystagmus in many ways, because these, in addition to the patients having an oscillation of the eyes, many patients, and I'll show you some data, more than two thirds of the patients will have other abnormalities of the eye and visual system, including problems with the retina, which are objective, you know, the objective problems that we can see, which are retinal optic nerve, the eyes don't work together, they have lazy eye in one of the two eyes, they need glasses, that's what amotropia is, or they can't use the lenses in their eyes to read with hypoaccommodation. And those are things that we can detect objectively with examinations. The patients complain of decreased vision, decreased color and contrast, decreased mo motion and how fast they see the world, decreased depth. The visual field is affected and restricted based on their head positions. And they have, uh, uh, it takes a while for them to see the same targets that you and I see, which is, which is a uh, motion detection abnormality, and they see better in different positions of the eye in orbit or gaze. They don't function as well with their vestibular or balance or a front, right, front back, right, left mechanism, and many of them have light problems such as light sensitivity and light interference. This is some recent data that I put together on 600 children with nystagmus, 449 of which had infantile nystagmus. And you can see that amblyopia or lazy eye is present in a third of these patients. So one eye being better than the other and needing traditional lazy eye or amblyopia treatment is necessary in a third of them. 23% of periodicity or aperiodicity and uh, two thirds have an eccentric null zone, even if they don't have a head posture. They have a positioning gaze that's not straight. When they look to the sides, their nystagmus is better, even if they don't use it. Most, most patients with INS have strabismus. The eyes don't work together, 70%. And almost everybody, over 80% needs glasses. It's very common. So INS and, and other eye disorders, any eye disorders present in 64% of patients. And this includes front of the eye problems and back of the eye problems. So these patients need a full ophthalmic evaluation. Systemically, uh, unfortunately, this patient population also has uh, a number of other associated systemic issues, the most common of which is albinism. That's the, the, the most. So 65% of patients have some associated condition. And if we take albinism out, then it's really a lot less. Neurological disorders, prematurities, other developmental delays, and mul a multitude of different types of genetic disorders, many of them one-offs, can be associated with uh, nystagmus in infancy and childhood. The head position and nystagmus is very complex. And I'm bringing this slide up not to confuse you, but to show you what the head position is the result of all of this together. So a clinician who doesn't take any of these conditions into account and just looks at the head position and then tries to treat it and is ignoring all of these other variables may get into some trouble with either medical or surgical treatment because there's dynamic nystagmus components and non-dynamic or static nystagmus components. And then there's non-nystagmus components. One thing we recently found out was that children who grow up 
using a head posture, the brain thinks that head posture is straight. So when there's treatment for the head posture by moving the eyes, the patient still will posture their head after surgery or after medical treatment because the brain thinks that crooked head posture is a straight head posture. So the reason for a persistent head posture after treatment is not because it's, it's uh, still from the eyes. So how do we treat the nystagmus? Well, we can treat, and I'll talk specifically about the nystagmus itself, although without going into a lot about treating all of the other eye conditions, I'm gonna focus on the oscillation itself. So we can treat the underlying etiology as I talked about with cataracts. And here's another example from the basic science literature. These are a Briard sheep puppy. This is a Briard sheep puppy who on the left has an RPE 65 uh, defect of the retina which causes congenital stationary night blindness and the puppy is blind in the developing critical period or close to blind, is at least night blind and peripherally lost. You can see the nystagmus on the dog. If you look at the limbus here, you can see, look right where the brown meets white. This puppy was given subretinal injection of, of a virus gene transfer therapy during development and the nystagmus went away because the puppy got vision. So we treated the nystagmus by treating the underlying developmental abnormality. <clears throat> There's three types of treatment for the oscillation itself, medical treatment, optical treatment, and surgical treatment. Medical treatments include things like oral medications and topical medications. Optical treatments include things like glasses, contact lenses, computer assisted devices, and surgery is surgery on the eye muscles. There's a whole group of non-traditional therapies, including uh, now people are starting to use CBD oil. I haven't studied it. I don't have a lot of experience with it. Uh, I do have experience with mindfulness meditation and it seems to help as well. So there's those, if we include the non-traditional, there's really four types of things that, and I'm not, I'm not gonna speak about every type of treatment, these are the most common medications that I use to treat nystagmus with the most common being baclofen. It works very well when the child has periodicity. So anywhere between 17 and 39% of patients can benefit from baclofen by reducing the periodicity. So reducing the dynamicity of their condition and in improving their baseline oscillation. So they're not swinging between extremes. And it's very well tolerated. It's been used in pediatrics for decades, four or five decades. So I'm going to spend the, uh, the, the remainder of this on surgery itself. Uh, surgery on the eye muscles for nystagmus has really not initially been for nystagmus. It's been for the head posture associated with nystagmus. Because when patients look to the side, the nystagmus is less. And so they see better. So they turn their heads to keep that side vision straight ahead. Uh, a guy named J.R. Anderson, this is his picture from when I was in Melbourne, and this is my copy of his original textbook. In 1959, he published his experience with straightening the head. He was one of the first people to do it, along with uh, Kestenbaum in New York and Goto in Japan. They were the first three people to regularly do eye muscle surgery to straighten the head. That was their goal, to straighten the head of patients with nystagmus. But what he noticed was that in addition to straightening the head, the nystagmus got better and their vision got better. He was the only one who noticed that. And he says this on page 170, and that was in 1959. No one did anything with that until Lou Deloso and John Flynn, again in the late 70s and early 80s, started recording the eye movements of patients who had the Anderson Kestenbaum eye, eye muscle surgical procedure in Florida uh, he, they did eye movement recordings and found that their eye movements got better, that their nystagmus improved after the surgery. It wasn't until the 90s when we found, and I started working with Lou, and we found these another animal model of nystagmus. And these dogs, these achiasmatic Belgian sheepdogs, have no optic chiasm. The nerves go right back to each side of the brain. It's very peculiar neurologic disturbance. But they also have seesaw nystagmus, and they also have infantile nystagmus. So in these animals, over the course of years, first characterizing their nystagmus in their brains and their retinas, we hypothesized there was something about the surgery itself, not moving the muscles or moving the eyes or moving the head. There may have been something about cutting the muscle that caused the nystagmus to change. 
So we did uh, some trials in, in the dogs where we actually either moved the muscle back or just cut it and reattached it where there was no mechanical effect. And it turned out that just cutting the muscle and reattaching it had the effect on the nystagmus. As a result of this animal data, we then did two NEI-sponsored blinded human trials showing that doing just tenotomy and reattachment of the muscle did affect the nystagmus in patients who otherwise would not need any eye muscle surgery for strabismus or a head posture, that just cutting the eye muscle and putting them back helped the nystagmus. But why does this happen? What, what goes on? Well, this is what happens when you record the eye movements of a person before and after eye muscle surgery. The eyes still wiggle. As a matter of fact, if you count the number of times the eyes wiggle over the course of, five, of a second, it's about five times in this patient. And if you record the number of times the eyes go back and forth in this patient after surgery, it's about the same. So it looks to the average clinician or to maybe a parent or maybe a friend <clears throat> or significant other that after eye muscle surgery, nothing happened. But in fact, what's happening is the intensity of the nystagmus, its amplitude has gotten better. And the amount of time during each beat when the brain can capture the world has quadrupled. So all visual functions have improved or do improve. So as a result of those early operations on over the last 15 to 20 years and operating on thousands of patients with nystagmus, what I've tried to do again is make it easy for my, clini my clinical colleagues around the world to use an algorithm to treat infantile nystagmus patients with surgery. So any strabismus surgeon, any pediatric ophthalmologist can see any patient with nystagmus and apply this algorithm, they have these techniques, to the patient and do an operation for nystagmus and get the same results that I get in Akron. And this is the list of them. It's not the detailed algorithm that I published, but this is a comprehensive summary. This is another example of a pretty typical child with albinism who has a chin down posture. And you can see up here the eye movement recording before the surgery and then the eye movement recording after these big spikes are blinks. And there's almost no nystagmus present. There are a few patients and I can't quite figure it out why the effect is different in different patients at slightly different ages or slightly different ocular conditions, but I have some patients where there's almost no visible nystagmus after surgery. And I have some patients where it's much better, but it's still really visible, but it all, I've never recorded a patient and seen the nystagmus either stay the same or get worse. Well, here's some of the data that I need. Uh, to look at visual acuities or black letters on a white screen as an outcome for nystagmus surgery is only important if I wanna get a paper published in ophthalmology journal or if a patient wants to get their license because black letters on a white screen are really a meaningless measure of visual function in the real world. The real world is not full of black and white or else it looked like a 1940s cartoon. But we have to study it and uh, it is a sign of visual function but it's not a good sign of eye movement function. Overall, about 75% of patients will get one to three lines and 15% will get three lines or more in their best optical correction. But what really changes in patients who have nystagmus surgery is the dynamic components of their visual function and their gaze dependent visual function. So before surgery, a patient would have to look over here. They have a null zone and this is the Jersey Turnpike. They look on the left over here and they can see clearly if their eyes move straight ahead or to the right, things start to blur up. What we thought happened after surgery was the null zone moved to straight ahead. But what actually happens is the null zone moves over and becomes huge. And we, we've been measuring this by turning the patient's head and measuring visual function as a, as a function of eye position in orbit. And just to show you what this data looks like in a large group of patients, down here, if this whole square is white, that would be you and I. So everywhere we look, we see the same. Functional vision space in patients after eye muscle surgery does this. And this is an example of one patient. And this showing the data on a large group of patients with a significant improvement in functional vision space where they can see by moving their eyes where they see the same. And that makes a dramatic effect during dynamic activities. This is a group of patients, the largest group who have albinism, but this is even a more unique group than that. These are 85 patients who have OCA1, the most severe form of albinism. 
And as a group, their acuity improved from 2170 to 2080 as a group after surgery alone. And that's when they've had their best optical correction in place. And also best optical correction and those who needed to treat with baclofen for their periodicity and surgery. So if you do medical, optical and surgical treatment in patients with ocular cutaneous albinism type one, you increase their visual function and visual acuity substantially, including contrast sensitivity. This is, a, this is an example of pre and post contrast sensitivity curves in one particular patient after uh, surgery. We just recently published a paper on adults, 81 adults with infantile nystagmus who never had any eye muscle surgery. And there was significant improvement in vision and visual function in the adults. And more interestingly, 60% of the patients who were, who were previously ineligible to drive could now drive after eye muscle surgery alone for their nystagmus from childhood. So these are the things we've studied so far that improve. All of the things on the left, not just black letters on a white screen. Many aspects of visual function improve when you make the nystagmus better. It seems to make sense, right? I know we have to do the science, but if I slow the eyes down or stop them completely, then your vision is gonna get better. And here's our conclusions. These are the things that happen as a result of eye muscle surgery. And it doesn't matter why the surgery is done whether it's done for strabismus, for nystagmus, for head posture, or if you just cut the muscle and reattach it. Why? Why does cutting the muscle make the nystagmus better? Well, we tried to figure this out. We think we have an idea. It's this area of the muscle where the tendon joins the sclera that the incision is made. And I've labeled that area the anthesial area of the extraocular muscle. And I stole that term from rheumatology where they use that for where tendon attaches to bone. And when we send specimens for pathology, we cut it right there and send the muscle, or we cut it right there and send the eye. We developed a technique when I was at NIH where we cut this part off and sent it for pathology and we found new nerves. And these new nerves went back to the brain centers that control eye movements. And we think these are sensory nerves back to the eye movement control centers. And these are perturbed during development and stimulating them, cutting them uh, decreases the nystagmus. As a result of this, we hypothesize that if we could influence these anthesial endings non-surgically, maybe with medications, uh, then we could also influence the nystagmus. And it turns out there's a group of medications that actually does that. This is an adult patient who was on uh, Diamox for another reason, which is a carbonic anhydrase in inhibitor. It's used some, sometimes for headaches or raised intracranial pressure or sometimes for glaucoma. And he was, when he was on the Diamox, he said his nystagmus was better. And it turns out, so better is down and worse is up. And with the Diamox, his, his nystagmus was better than it was alone. There's a drop that contains Diamox and it's called brinzolamide. So we put him on the drop and with the drop, his nystagmus was better. So this is one case report. As a result of this, we did a clinical trial where we took patients and gave them either the drop or a placebo and then switched and put them on the, the ones who had the drop got the, got the placebo and the ones who had the placebo got the drop. And it turned out that the Azop improved their nystagmus. So this topical car carbonic anhydrase inhibitor improved their nystagmus and visual functions. And we published that in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. It's been a few years now. And another topical medication came to our attention. Here's the, you can read the story, but a patient accidentally got a pesticide in his eye, and this is now 12 years ago, and he thought he was gonna go blind by the time he ran to his uh, house from his farm where he was spraying the pesticide and washed it out, his eye was fine. He didn't hurt his eye, but he said he could see better. And he went to his ophthalmologist and the ophthalmologist said, uh, your nystagmus is better. So he told me about this. We got it put into a drop form and we tested it in another animal model. And these are the Briard sheepdogs with the RP65 defect who have the nystagmus. And if you look at Ginger's eye, you can see the nystagmus here. And this is Ginger and Scout. So we gave them the drops. Here's Ginger getting tested, doing her eye movement recordings. And here's the drop. And we just published this. And if you look at Ginger before and after, if you look at her nystagmus, you can see it present and there's no nystagmus here. And we, we treated her right after weaning. 
and Ernest Agnes is gone. This drug is in developmental phase. Uh, I'm doing these phase one and phase two studies in the Philippines, and I've been trying to get it uh, to do this in patients for the last 11 years. There's been a lot of uh, challenges, but we're not giving up. We're gonna see if this drug actually does work. So I'll end with this. This is uh, a, a good friend of mine, Severe Zeki, who is, we were together in New Zealand. He's very famous. He has an area of the brain named after him. And this is, he wrote this in his book. And so if we feel that somehow some of our research is a little bit out there, then I turn to this and say, I just have to go with the facts. I just have to go with the research and go with the data and our experience. And here are, here's Ginger with her brother, Stanley, waiting for me to give them a treat. And she's living with us now and she's doing fine. She does have a retinal disease, which limits her vision, but you couldn't tell if you were here with her. And certainly she bosses Stanley around. So that is my talk. I'm gonna stop sharing and look at your Q&A board. Yeah, please, if you have questions, make sure you put them in either the chat or the Q&A box. It looks like there's questions in both of those, Rich. Yeah, okay. Well, the, the Q&A question about the drugs, I don't have a lot of answers for the drugs and it's future. So I don't, someone wrote me, do I need to be on the drug? I, I don't know if it's the new one or the Azop. So the, the drug is not a cure. I do not have a cure for nystagmus. I only have a treatment. So if, if we do medical treatment, then you need to be on medical treatments like high blood pressure, you know? So if the Azop, if the Azop is effective and you're improved by it, then you have to stay on it. I, uh, about 50% of the patients that I put on Azop as older children or as adults choose to stay on it because they feel it's benefiting them. Even though in almost all of them, it helps the nystagmus even after surgery, most don't sense that additional benefit, but some do and they stay on the Azop. Uh, okay. Hi, McKenna. <laughs> Uh, how often should these tests be repeated once in your clinic? People ask how often should the test be repeated? Uh, well, I do, the, I do a lot of the testing over and over again when I see people because I want to see what happens to the tests as they change over time. I think that each clinician has their own sense of how much that should be done. But I do them every time I see the patient. I, child should, I think a, a child should use contact lenses as soon as they can. It's a very, there's four advantages to contact lenses. The first is that the quality of the, of the optics is better. So everybody sees better with contacts than glasses. The second is that if they do have to posture their head a little, they're not looking through the edge of the frame or the lens. The third is you can tint the lenses, which help with light interference and light sensitivity. And the fourth is physical contact of the lens with the eye seems to further reduce the nystagmus. It may be affecting those anthesial and, and I prescribe baclofen um, usually when the children are in preschool or to school age. So I don't think there's any more value to doing a second eye, eye surgical procedure for the nystagmus. So I never do a second procedure for the nystagmus itself. I will do a second procedure and 25% of patients who I do surgery on need a second procedure. And it's for one of three things. Either they have a new head posture. So before they were like tilted and turned and after surgery, now it's just pure chin up or chin down. Or there's, their eyes are in an abnormal position. So they develop a strabismus that needs to be corrected or there's a complication. So those are the only three reasons that I do a reoperation. The best age for surgery is when the child gets on their feet. 10 to 14 months, unless they have associated strabismus, then I do it earlier. If they have infantile or congenital strabismus, then I do it earlier. It's great. Well, there were some more questions here. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about TMS. Uh, any child can try the drops. I wouldn't try any medication without at least having some pre and post evaluation by a clinician. I think children, 
someone asked me if they think it's better to have surgery soon or wait for medication. I, I wouldn't wait to have anybody treated if there's treatments that are effective and have a good benefit ratio, you know? If the benefit risk ratio is high, look at this, look at it this way, making a choice, and this is part of my counseling. When you make a choice to, uh, when you have a child that has a problem, I don't care what problem it is, and you're, you have an opinion about what needs to be done, then the family has a choice. And the choice is to do nothing or to do something. So doing nothing is, is a choice, it's still a choice. So let's look at it further. What's the risk of doing nothing worsening the risk of doing something. And that's really, I think, a better way to think about this. The risk of doing nothing in an eight-year-old with nystagmus, I think, is much greater for the child than the risk of doing something. Yes, I have seen actual improvements in null point with contacts, yes. Uh, uh, that's a good question. Is scleral contact lens is more beneficial? I don't know. Um, my partner, my optometric partner is fitting them and I'm actually doing that. I'm recording those patients now. That's really a good question. How early can we do, I'm recording birth. Is laser surgery something that can be done? Yes, I encourage it actually. I have patients who've had it done. I think it actually further improves the nystagmus and improves visual function optically, especially in patients with high refractive errors. The key is the partnership with the refractive surgeon. That's the key to success. The OCA itself does not cause nystagmus. Uh, I'm happy to explain that to you. I'll try and do it quickly. So the oculocutaneous albinism is a genetic disorder of, hypo, of, of uh, pigmentary disturbance. That's how it's classified or hypopigmentation. It's a result of a genetic disorder where the, a system, an enzyme system doesn't work, the tyrosinase system. The tyrosinase system, the metaphor I like to use, think of them as uh, construction workers during development or your house is being built, the baby's being built and I subcontract out the legs, the arms, the heart. Well, there's subcontractors that make pigment, the tyrosinase system. But imagine these subcontractors have two jobs. They have a job, same group of people. They have a job in the womb and they have a job after birth. The tyrosinase system during development doesn't make pigment or very little. What it mostly does is help develop the optic nerve and retina. And then after birth, it makes pigment. So if I have a genetic disorder of tyrosinase where the system works perfectly in the womb, but doesn't work that well after birth, that's all the blonde haired blue eyed people on the planet. And we don't call them albinos because they don't have anything else wrong except they're hypopigmented. If the system doesn't work at all in the womb, but works after birth, it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't work either way. It doesn't work at all in the womb and doesn't work at all after birth. That's OCA1 or the pink eyed white haired albinos. And now imagine every combination of those. <clears throat> the reason these kids have nystagmus is because remember my train metaphor. If the optic nerve and retina are not fully developed at birth, then the ability to see is delayed. And the communication between the developing ability to see and the developing ability to move the eyes is disrupted and broken, so they get the nystagmus. For the same reason, the kid with the cataracts got them. So the albinism, the hypopigmentation does not cause the nystagmus. Then the genetic defect is the first domino. Then the next domino is the malfunctioning of the tyrosinase system. Then the next domino is the underdevelopment of the optic pathways. Then the next domino <coughs> is the delay in visual maturation. And then now we're down to six or seven dominoes where we get the nystagmus. I hope that helps. Uh, I haven't studied head tilt before and after drugs. So does the drug affect the head tilt? I, I don't know. I don't usually do drugs for head tilt. I usually will recommend surgery. So nystagmus uh, is not caused by a retinal dystrophy. Nystagmus is caused by a disorder of the ocular motor system that's due to a, a poor communication between the developing ability to see and the developing ability to move the eyes. So if the problem 
if the domino is the retinal dystrophy. So if a child is born with board, bad rods or cones, it's the same thing I was discussing with albinism. It's not the retinal dystrophy that causes the nystagmus because if you mess, if you give the child a retinal dystrophy, <clears throat> the same retinal dystrophy at six months of age that they, and, and they're from one to six months, they're normal, they're not going to have nystagmus. So it's a, it's a disorder, nystagmus, infantile nystagmus, is a disorder of the developing visual system, which occurs at a critical period, usually between one and four months of age. Uh, I haven't seen Dr. Yang's data on darkness yet, but it seems really interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing that data. Someone was asking about checking visual acuity. Yeah, I, I, that's a big topic. Everybody does it differently, unfortunately. The, what Someone asked me what the typical time for recovery from eye muscle surgery. Well, if you're about a year to two years, you're back to full activity in 24 to 48 hours. If you're over 10 years and, and a male, uh, about a year. If you're over 10 years and a female, maybe a week. Everybody's a little different, but in general, uh, recovery is pretty quick. Usually I, let, uh, I suggest everyone to go back to full activity eight days after surgery, but everybody recovers differently. I think I got them all. Some of the other one. Contacts need to be, yeah, the contacts uh, don't have to have a prescription in it. No, you can just put plain old lenses on. Our son is three, high myopia and nystagmus. If we decide on surgery, will we see a difference in the myopia? No. Or acuity? Maybe. So the goal of eye muscle surgery is not black letters on a white screen. The goal of eye muscle surgery is to make the eye muscle system better. And then making the eye muscle system better will improve some visual functions. We don't know exactly what those are gonna be in any one patient. They have to be measured. I hope, that, I hope I've, there's a few points that I think are really important from my point of view to get across. And I hope that my reinforcement and reiteration of those has made sense. If not, I'm glad it's being taped. <laughs> Uh, we're just about at time here. So if you see any other questions you want to think you want to answer, that's great. If not, we can wrap no, up. It looks like we're done, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Sounds fantastic. Th thank you very much. This was a fantastic presentation. We always love having you at our conference. And thank you very much for, for supporting right, A&N. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It's real. I'm really sorry that you're not physically together because I think that's the most valuable part of this meeting. To have the kids meet other kids like themselves, there's nothing like it. Nothing mm -hmm. like it. I hope you get to be together soon. Yep, see you guys. Hopefully. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. All right, everybody will be back. Yeah, we have a 15 minute break. So we'll be back at 4.15 for the uh, panel discussions.